I'm Charles O'Haron III. My grandfather was senior and was a newspaper editor in Spartanburg. And he came up here in about 1911 and bought property on Scout Camp Road. Some of that property has been given to the camp there. But that started an influx of people coming up here from Spartanburg. Daddy, who's Charles O'Haron Jr., came up on horseback. He came up driving horses in the wagon, and sometimes they brought a milk cow with them. So a lot of his tales of growing up in Saluda are in his I Remember Saluda book, which is available here. <laughs> and and if, if you buy a copy, you can call me and I'll give you a little bit of money back. But <laughs> it's, really, it's really worth reading it because it's tales of being uh, growing up here a long time ago and blending in with the, the folks who lived here uh, is quite a, quite a read. Uh, the Orchard Inn used to have one of these books in every bedroom. My name has the third on the end of it, and that's sort of a southern tradition, I think. And if you live in a big family, there's going to be a lot of juniors and thirds. And if you have a friend whose name seems to be Trey, he's usually, he's usually the third. And I'm not going to tell you anything new here tonight because all of you, most of you here from big families, and uh, family is a lot of what Saluda is about. It's, it's the mainstay of my memories that I have of Saluda. Up here, you, you live with your cousins if you're lucky. You come up in the summertime and your aunts will take turns enduring for a week. The husbands typically work. They were salesmen, stuff like that. And they would, they would bring the kids back and forth on the weekend and the aunt would be stuck with keeping the five, five boys and my sister Hetty was the only girl in the crowd. She had a fairly rough time, I think. Although the aunts were very nice to her. But the cousins ranged uh, in age variation from mine, uh, two that were older, one the same age, and, and uh, two younger than me. So torture was very much like uh, <laughs> catcher in the rye. <laughs> the, older, the older cousins would just torture the younger ones. We, at that point, we had, on Casey's branch, we had a gravitational shower box. I don't know, if, a water box. I don't know if you know what that is. It's a, it's a box up the creek uphill and a pipe running down for washing up that sort of thing not drinking water the drinking water was further down the road and the little boys went down with a pail of, to get the drinking water and it came up and halfway back your older cousin would start gooching you i don't know if you know what <laughs> gooch, gooch is but it's tickling you under your arm and of course you'd spill your water and of course you'd have to go back down again and start the whole thing over but we did lots of wonderful things. We went, we went fishing and hiking and so forth. Cousin Tucker McCravey would torture us the most. We would go on a hike, and every afternoon at 2 o'clock, 2.30, uh, there would be a thunderstorm, and we'd be up on a big dry ridge. And he would say, you've got to take that belt off. And we said, why you got to take the belt off? He said, it's got a metal buckle on it. Lightning will hit you. <laughs> so, let me borrow your stick there. Here the little boys come all down the mountain, you know, with their, with their belt on, on the end of the stick. <laughs> he also told us we, we could mine diamonds, and he would get a quartz rock about this big, and we would take a hammer and start beating on it. So it's just uh, delicious, delicious mischief is what some people call living with their cousins. Uh, the trip up, up 176 in those days was fairly frightening to a young lad sitting in the back seat of an old Ford or something. I used to have nightmares about going up and down 176. In the nightmare, the car would always break in two. And, <laughs> and one of those steep curves before you get to the twin bridges. And the, I was in the back, and the back is what plummeted off over the, over the ridge and down into the, down into the river. Uh, the scout camp at that time had Palmetto Lake down at the bottom of it, and that's where we learned to swim. And when we went down there, some several of us did not know how to swim until Uncle, Uncle uh, Lindsay threw us in that lake, and that, that water was very cold. And we used to use a trick. It was before you had inflatable toys and so forth. We would take a, a pillowcase with us, and you can do a pillowcase like that, and it makes a float. And you could float around on the top of the water, which is a lot warmer than, than down <laughs> below. Uh, 
later on, when I was in uh, probably in late high school or maybe even early college, I rode a bicycle all the way from inland up to Saluda, and I got in the newspaper. Can you imagine that? <laughs> I don't think anybody had ridden a bicycle that far around here before then. <laughs> and, I, and I came up Howard Gap Road, and at that point, it, it was all dirt. So I, I did a good bit of walking instead of uh, riding. <laughs> <laughs> it was a single speed bike. It was a three speed. I was lucky. But those three speeds didn't get you the whole way. Well, was the walking in the paper? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, just strictly riding. <laughs> All right, the houses that we lived in there were kind of a conglomerate of houses. People in the north call something like that camp. They say, we're going to camp. So that'd be their family enclave. Well, our school, I call it the shack. It has a proper name, Hidden Well, because it was well hidden. But <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a sawmill lumber shack, if you know what that means. And it was just stud frame on the inside and didn't really have an interior wall. But it had... Uh, a couple of them had metal roofs and others just had shingle roofs. But there was a kitchen house that had a dining room in it and then the big house which had three or four bedrooms in it and had the boys house and had Aunt Dot's house. Well, Aunt Dot was my grandmother's sister and she's a nurse and wore dentures and she went clack, clack, clack. <laughs> like that all the time. And she had a Corvair and there was a straight drive and a teenage boys, we would go out to, to Lake Summit and come back in that Corvair and boy, we would really rip it. <laughs> Right now, Carol and I are fortunate to be living in mother and daddy's house. It's a nice full circle type thing. We really love being in town. Uh, if you're going to be in a small town, live in town. Be able to walk around. It's just a great pleasure. You go out and see your friends, uh, your, friend, your neighbor's dog can bite you. Uh, <laughs> you might step in a trace of your neighbor's dog in your front yard, but, but it's all very pleasant. Uh, being in Saluda is being part of a community, and it's, it's just very rewarding. You, when you've been in Saluda and you travel away, Saluda is always in your heart and in your mind, and I, I feel very strongly about that. Yesterday, I was 75 years old. <laughs> so, so, no, no. <laughs> Daddy was giving a talk, reading from his book one time up here at the library, and he gave his talk, and a little old lady in the audience, who was probably younger than me, said, how old are you anyway? And, and Daddy said he was 87 or 92 or something. And she said, huh, I got a boy that's 72. <laughs> <laughs> and at, at that time, I thought 72 was getting pretty old. <laughs> so uh, just be strong and keep Saluda in your heart and be Enjoy your neighbors and your community. Uh, if you see a young family of four, try to think of some way that they can stay in Saluda. <laughs> Thank you.